This lecture provides a brief introduction to transportation engineering, including a discussion of key players, processes, and other aspects of transportation. After today's lecture, students should be able to discuss the various activities involved in transportation engineering, as well as recent trends in transportation, and they should be able to define key transportation agencies and the role that these agencies play in the broader context of transportation engineering. So to start with, we'll provide a brief definition of transportation, which is simply stated the movement of people and or goods from one place to another. So in transportation, we're essentially trying to get persons or goods from point A to point B in order to satisfy several competing constraints and objectives. And so the process by which we facilitate for effective transportation is referred to as transportation engineering. Now, transportation engineering is defined by the Institute of Transportation Engineers, or ITE, as the application of technology and scientific principles, which includes planning, design, operations, and then long-term maintenance and management of these facilities for various modes of transportation. So most of our work in this class will focus within the realm of highway engineering, but this would also be broadly applicable to air transportation, rail transportation, water transportation, and so forth. And regardless of the mode, we are generally as transportation engineers trying to provide for transport of goods and services that A is efficient from a time standpoint or rapid. We'd like to get persons from point A to point B as quickly as possible. The secondary concern there is safety, so we're trying to minimize the likelihood of crashes occurring, and if a crash does occur, we like to mitigate its severity. And then we have a variety of complementary concerns as well, which could include comfort from a road user standpoint, convenience and access to transportation systems, how economical these are from the road user standpoint, and then also looking at any potential adverse environmental impacts and trying to mitigate their consequences as well. So as transportation engineers, years, we are generally trying to simultaneously accomplish this wide range of goals and that's what we'll be covering as a part of this course. And so when we talk about transportation engineering, there are essentially five general phases or activities involved with transportation engineering. And so those would include at the highest level planning activities. So from a road agency standpoint, we'd like to be able to put together an inventory of our road network, what facilities we have available to us and what's included in those facilities as well as what their condition is. So the quality of the pavement on a roadway, how well a roadway link is performing from an operational standpoint, how many crashes occur on that segment. And and what are the status of the various features associated with that roadway network. And if we have a good idea of what our system looks like currently and what it's projected to look like moving forward, we can then use a series of analytical models to try to project how system performance will vary over time. And from that, we can determine where there are weaknesses or areas for improvement in our system, and then we can plan projects and programs accordingly. So once we've determined that a project is necessary, we would then go through some sort sort of design process and the most general example is horizontal and vertical alignment. So designing how the curves align on a roadway would be one example of design. And once that design has been completed, going out and then actually constructing that facility. And so a lot of this would be covered in complementary classes in the construction engineering area, but we'll at least talk in generalities about how construction fits into the bigger picture. And then once that road is actually put into operation, uh, transportation agencies are currently investing extensive efforts to provide essentially real-time monitoring of the performance of the system or how well it's operating, which is where the term operations comes from. So what we see right here in this diagram, these are just snapshots from a few what we refer to as traffic operations centers. Generally, DOTs, uh, just like the Iowa DOT here in the state, are providing real-time monitoring of the freeway network and many of the other major arterials that are under the control of those municipalities and and road agencies as well. And so from these traffic operations centers, we're able to collect real-time data on traffic speeds, traffic volumes, assess whether there are traffic crashes or other incidents that are affecting performance of road facilities. And then we can create proactive response in the event of some sort of issues with the road network, whether that relates to a work zone, for example, or a vehicle breaking down on the side of the road. And then going beyond operations, we're also concerned with maintenance, both short-term and long-term. So long-term, 
when we're talking largely about construction projects, similar to what we had discussed previously, how frequently roads need to be maintained, what exactly is involved in those maintenance activities, and then also shorter duration maintenance if we need to go out and do some quick fixes, pothole repairs, things of that nature. And so there's a wide range of different activities that are involved in transportation engineering. And as a part of this course, we'll provide some level of coverage of, of various phases of these activities. And one question that arises often is how our transportation network has evolved so that it's essentially how it became what it is today. And so what we see right here, this is just a schematic map that outlines the interstate highway system. And so what you see here, we've got a series of high speed roadways or the interstates which connect large cities across the country basically. So this isn't to scale here, but this is providing us a nice simplistic version of each of these various interstates and where they run to and from. And so the Eisenhower interstate system was actually the largest public works project in the history of the world. And so this was completed over a series of several decades. And as you can see, it connects virtually every major city in the United States can be accessed by these interstate facilities. And subsequent to that, we've got a complementary road network as well, which is referred to as the National Highway System, which includes the Eisenhower Interstate System, as well as any other highways of national significance. So it includes the interstates, it includes any US routes, and it also includes a large number of state maintained highways as well. So when we look at these roadways, highways are generally designed so that they can accommodate two primary functions. And those functions are mobility and accessibility. So you can look at any type of road and assess its mobility, which is measuring its ability to provide continuous high speed travel. So people would be able to travel on a road that has high mobility because they can move quickly with minimum time from one location to another. But in combination, with that our road system also needs to provide for access. So accessibility refers to the roadway's ability to actually get you to your destination endpoint for example. So a parking lot or the driveway to your house and if we look at different types of road facilities interstates for example would provide very high levels of mobility. You can travel as fast as you would like up to a practical upper limit but very low access. You can't get into your driveway directly from an interstate for example. Whereas lower class facilities like your local street network will have very good access, you can get door to door, but speeds and mobility as a function of that are much, much lower. And so as you see in the diagram right here, there's a clear trade off between mobility and access and we'll operate different types of facilities so that they're either primarily satisfying mobility versus accessibility versus a combination of the two as we'll cover in a few of our subsequent lectures. This slide demonstrates recent trends in passenger vehicle traffic. So what we see here this is intercity passenger traffic, so going from one city to another, long distance travel essentially. And what we see on the y axis here is the number of passenger miles traveled in millions across the United States going back to the 1960s. And we see how that mode share has changed with respect to highway versus air versus rail versus transit. And unsurprisingly, we've seen relatively stable and low levels of utilization of transit and the rail system. We've seen significant increases in air traffic over the past 40 to 50 years, but they haven't been nearly that of what we've seen in the highway network. So now we see virtually every household in America has an automobile, and we had seen a period of nearly consistent linear growth from the 60s up through roughly 2000. Now subsequently over the last 10 years that traffic has leveled off as you can see right here. But this drastic growth that we've experienced over time has had a number of repercussions that we're feeling with respect to operation of this transportation network. If we look at the freight side of things, so the prior slide demonstrated the movement of persons over long distance. This is demonstrating freight movement and somewhat surprisingly perhaps you'll notice here that the largest share of freight traffic is actually using our rail system. And the primary reason for that is that the rail system is relatively low cost to operate and ship particularly for very large pieces of cargo. We've seen significant increases in the share of truck traffic, so this would be large commercial vehicles or semi-trucks you would see on the interstate system, for example, and we've seen drops in transport by water and less transport by air as well, and a lot of that relates to cost and accessibility issues for those respective types of facilities. 
So looking at large scale trends in travel, what we see right here, this is just showing us the relative ratio if we compare at five year increments back to a baseline of 1980. This is vehicle miles of travel, so how much traffic is generated nationally versus the number of lane miles that are present in the transportation system. And so what you see if you go back over the last 30 to 40 years is traffic has been increasing at a very rapid rate but our road infrastructure has remained relatively stable and you've probably noticed we're not constructing a lot of new roads and so consequently we have a system that's largely built up but this increase in traffic volume has made it congested and introduced a number of maintenance concerns which we're now trying to deal with and so the fully built system is just under a million miles in some total and that includes a 45,000 mile interstate system as well as 161,000 miles for our national highway system which includes those higher class facilities I had alluded to previously. And so each of these highways is subject to a number of important transportation related concerns as we'll detail on the next slide. So those three primary areas that comprise many of our current transportation challenges are congestion, safety, and infrastructure. So congestion, we're essentially looking at the effects of adding a large number of cars to our road facilities. And so if we look in some total, there are roughly 314 million people in the United States. And with that, we have 253 million automobiles approximately. And if we try to account for the costs in terms of lost productivity and the other operation and maintenance costs associated with this congestion, the monetary value of the economic losses due to congestion amount to roughly $121 billion annually, which is actually very small in comparison to the safety costs. If we look nationally, we've been averaging anywhere between 30 and 35,000 traffic fatalities each year in the United States over the past decade or so, and an additional 2 million injuries. And if we account for the costs of these crashes, those add up to a staggering $300 billion annually. So just looking at operational and safety concerns, that comes close to a half trillion dollars, and that's before we consider the actual infrastructure costs. And if we look at the quality of our transportation system, there's been much publicity recently. Uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers issues an infrastructure report card, and it's been well publicized that our infrastructure in its totality received a grade of D plus during the most recent evaluation. And as you'll see here, our roads were given a grade of D. And in some total, to improve the entire American infrastructure by 2020 would require $3.6 trillion. Now, with roads being a, a poor portion of that, but quite a large portion if we look nationally. And a question that arises then is how do we actually pay for these improvements to our transportation system? And historically the answer to that question has been the gasoline tax. So I'm sure many of you are familiar, anytime you go to the gas pump, you're paying 18.4 cents per gallon for the federal gas tax. And then each state is also going to implement their own state-specific gas tax, which is then used to help provide additional supplementary funding to states for transportation improvements. And so those state taxes range from 11 cents in Alaska to a high of nearly 60 cents in Connecticut. And within the past 12 months, there's been a lot of discussion in Iowa, and we recently had our first increase in several decades to a state gas tax at 32 cents per gallon, which is right around in line with the state average across the United States here. And so just for a, a bit of a sense of scale, here that 10 cent increase is going to generate roughly an additional 215 million dollars per year and so our challenge moving forward is really to be able to sustain this level of funding because the gas tax is running into a rather severe practical issue in that vehicles are now being designed to be more fuel efficient than ever before and what the result of that is if vehicles are more fuel efficient we're not generating as much gas tax and so this is ultimately not a sustainable long-term enterprise and so we're looking at other ways to try to improve this and to raise additional monies. Another concern that comes into play here is that these taxes are not actually indexed to inflation. So Iowa had been at a 22 cent gas tax for several decades and since that wasn't accounting for the effects of inflation we're actually getting less bang for the buck over time and so the combination 
of the fact that it's not indexed for inflation and gasoline consumption is going down have created a real a real funding issue that currently a number of states are looking at creative ways to try to rebuild that base. And so looking at who expends these funds and who is building this transportation network, we'll just wrap up with a quick introduction to a few of the key transportation agencies. So when we talk about transportation, everything essentially runs through the United States Department of Transportation. So this is actually a cabinet level branch of the US government which means we have a secretary for transportation who oversees all aspects of the US DOT and the US DOT is then serving as an umbrella organization for a dozen additional agencies under its jurisdiction which would include the FAA the Federal Aviation Administration who's responsible for air traffic and that would include everything from air traffic control to security to the transport of cargo or passengers across the United States the highway network is under the jurisdiction of the Federal Highway Administration. So the FHWA serves several functions, but among the most important of those are allocating transportation funding and then also providing maintenance over any federally maintained highway facilities. The FMCSA or Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration is concerned with large truck traffic, so looking at commercial vehicles and semi-trucks. And there are very stringent guidelines in terms of the condition of those vehicles as well as driver regulations in terms of how frequently a person is able to drive and for how long. And so those are a few of the things that follow under FMCSA. The FRA, Federal Railroad Administration, is concerned with all rail-related transport, and this is becoming a larger issue in light of some initiatives where we're looking at high-speed rapid transit being implemented across the country. The Federal Transit Administration would deal with large-scale transit systems such as subways, light rail transit systems, as well as simple bus systems and dial-a-ride. There's a wide variety of different transit alternatives that are available. And NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, is focused exclusively on automobile safety, although the FHWA and some of the other partner organizations are focused more on the infrastructure side. NHTSA is more behaviorally focused, so looking at things like speeding, drinking and driving, seatbelt use, for example. Beyond those agencies falling under the USDOT, AASHTO is the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. And what AASHTO is, is essentially a collection of representatives from federal and state transportation agencies, consultants, essentially anyone who would be involved in transportation. And what AASHTO does is they provide high-level guidance for issues of importance to the country, really, so that we have consistent design standards, for example, with respect to the geometric design of highways or the pavement design. So AASHTO will be involved in developing guideline documents, um, for example. TRB is also an organization uh, that's providing national direction on these types of issues. So the Transportation Research Board essentially establishes short-term and long-term directives for research that's aimed in improving transportation policy and practice, making transport safer, more efficient, more economical, and so forth. NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, so in contrast to NHTSA, the NTSB is concerned with large-scale transportation disasters and accidents, so if there's an airline crash, if there's a bus crash, and in these types of events, it's possible that some of the other transportation agencies that fall under the US DOT could be found liable. So the NTSB is actually a completely independent third party that would investigate the causal factors that contribute to various large-scale transportation disasters. And then bringing this back home to Iowa, so the organizations we've talked to prior to this have all been essentially federal in nature. Here in the state, the Iowa DOT is responsible for planning, construction, operation of our highway facilities. And they work in partnership with the Iowa State Patrol as well as the Iowa Department of Public Safety. So the State Patrol, of course, is concerned with enforcing traffic regulations, including speed limits, drinking and driving, seatbelt laws, while the Department of Public Safety is largely looking at evaluating the performance of the transportation network in terms of impacts on crashes, injuries, and fatalities. And so as we go through this course, we'll get a closer introduction to a number of these agencies and how they are involved with the various processes and transportation objectives we had talked to up to this point.